Hello everyone, it's 11 o'clock here in Bloomington, Minnesota, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. My name is Jackie Carville and I'm the Marketing Director here at Immunochemistry Technologies. I'll be moderating this webinar today. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted, however we do encourage you to ask questions along the way. Simply type your question into the chat dialog at the right and select Send to Host. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send your chat to me and I will do my best to get you up and running. We will be posting the video recording of this webinar later this afternoon or tomorrow morning, so look out for an email from me after the webinar with a link to this recording. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Lee. Dr. Lee was a founder of ICT and served as the president until last March when he retired, but he continues to serve as our technical consultant to share his valuable expertise in immunoassay development. Today, he'll be going over some troubleshooting options for your ELISA development so that you can build better assays and resolve common issues. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Brian. Good morning, everybody. Um, the topic of this webinar today is uh, to try to address a few of the common universal problems with immunoassays. And um, these cross the board from ELISA to paper strips to beads to uh, whatever. And so we're going to use some, some a bit of generic type uh, uh, analogies uh, for this presentation that we'll use ELISA plate for the most part because it's something that's most familiar to everybody out there. But just to let you know that we're trying to be a little bit more broad, a broader brush when we talk about some of the problems that we're, that people encounter. Uh, we are Immunochemistry Technologies. We are located in uh, Wilmington, Minnesota, which is a suburb of the Minneapolis-St. Paul type metro area. We've been around since 1994. Uh, we initially were doing custom assay services, which involved uh, developing ELISAs and other types of immunoassays. We did antibody purification, conjugation, and more recently we are doing uh, small-scale lyophilization and ELISA plate coding. So our company still does this. In addition to that, we have several uh, consumer type reagents. We have a fluorescent uh, probe product line that uses a fluorescence for the signal generator, and we have ELISA solutions, which uh, basically entails um, we sell you uh, solutions that you can use to develop your own ELISA, even if you've never done it before. In many cases, that's that's, that is the case, is that people just haven't ever had to do this, and all of a sudden, now they have to do it. So that's kind of our uh, uh, activity and product profile. Um, this is just a short uh, summary of our uh, fluorescence line of products. Uh, we, I think <clears throat> our goal, our, our central goal for the most part is to try to detect uh, intracellular protease activity. And we're using fluorescence as the means by which you can detect the activity or the presence of these enzymes. And we, these are some of the common ones that most people are interested in uh, presently. So uh, this is what we have. We'll probably be expanding this product line you know, in the near future to add a couple more items of interest. But for right now, this is our list. Here's the ELISA Solutions group, and we're kind of focused on that today, but we sell everything from wash buffer to, to sample diodes to the substrate. Uh, we're sort of a one-stop shop when it comes to um, obtaining uh, solutions, since these are all liquid, um, to help you uh, develop or perform your in-house ELISA. Generally speaking, we have a <clears throat> immunoassays are, again, trying to be broad here, um, they can involve um, antigen antibody detection. So they're, they, their mechanism of operation is that they're, they, they're 
reliance upon the antibody antigen interaction. And without that, they typically don't, you know, we, we don't have this. It's not an immunoassay, it's called something else. And un under this category, we have uh, ELISA, lateral flow te technology, uh, we have testing spot, we have um, bead suspensions. These are just different selected examples of immunoassays. The common de denominator amongst all of these different uh, formats is that they rely upon a solid support to allow the um, unreacted or unbound material to be separated. So these, there's, these all have a solid support on which you can use, you can isolate that solid support and wash away the, the stuff you don't want during the assay process. We, this slide here, we, this, this slide, I put this in here because I wanted to comment about um, antigens and various things that people put on their ELISA plate when they're doing antigen down, and we'll just mention that um, in a couple minutes here. But antigens, by and large, most of the epitopes that the antibodies see are what we call non-contiguous epitopes, where you've got, um, you know, you have a, a secondary and tertiary structure here on the right, and so you can have a part of that antigen and it epitope on one part of the strand and then as it loops around, um, the other part of that epitope is on a different part. And if you adsorb these antigens uh, to a plate so that you can do an antigen down uh, format where you're looking for a specific antibody to a particular antigen, what can happen if the, if the protein and the polypeptides are very small, uh, you can lose that uh, antigenic epitope by the fact that when it lays down on the plate, they separate. And then that's shown here on the right, where you're showing the green bands, which are the epitopes, and they're no longer there if they get flattened out because of absorbing to the, absorbing to the polystyrene surface. Um, you no longer have something that you can use to uh, detect specific antibodies. Linear epitopes are, of course, um, always present, and they are not as predominant. So if you're just reliant upon linear epitopes, you're probably not going to see or be able to detect the antibodies that you're looking for because most of the uh, epitopes that antibodies see are are of the uh, uh, non-contiguous uh, format. This is antigen down that we were just talking about. And we're losing an ELISA plate to, to show the concept. Uh, antigens are absorbed to the plate. Those are the green balls there and then you block the plate, and then you come in with the antibody or a sample where you're looking for a specific antibody, and they will bind to the coated antigen that you've got on the plate, and then you can come in afterwards, after you wash, you can come in with an anti-isotype uh, 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 antibody label with, in this case, HRP, and so you can detect, you can, uh, uh, obtain a, a quantitative, or at least a very least a semi-quantitative um, uh, uh, opinion of how much of the um, antibody is present in your sample. So, if you're, let's say, you're checking out animals in a on a farm for livestock, you've got cattle, you've got swine, you've got avian chickens, you can coat place with a particular antigen. In this case, it could be a virus, it could be another bacterial agent, but you would coat that and then you can uh, take uh, bleed samples from the animals or your birds, uh, do your antigen down and you can get an impression, uh, actually a pretty good impression, of whether or not they've had a prior uh, immune exposure to the particular pathogen of interest. So this is routinely used all the time, and this it also is used for the wildlife uh, uh, 
when you have pathogens that affect uh, deer populations or elk or, or what have you, uh, they can go in and take samples from obviously a limited number of deer because they're uh, unless you're really fast, you're not going to run them down. So, but yeah, you can get samples from the animals, and you can determine the the uh, the the spread of this particular pathogen. So you can either address the problem either through some other you know avoidance mechanism, or you can you know you, there are ways to to uh, you know control this. You may have to be thinning herds, whatever, but it is a very, very common method, this antigen down, for assessing the prevalence of uh, pathogenic organisms, or at least exposure of it, because remember, this is past tense, because you don't get a, uh, you don't get an anamnestic immune response, which is what we're measuring here with the, with the, uh, the IgG that's particular to the antigen, but it does tell you that these animals have been exposed to a particular disease agent, and and so you know, what do you do to uh, address that? This slide is an um, antibody sandwich. Sandwich assays are usually used in the clinical area, uh, whereas the antigen down can be used either way. Uh, but these uh, these sandwich assays are very nice because you can detect a particular uh, antigen in serum, uh, urine, plasma. Uh, it could be used even for environmental purposes. Uh, if you've got uh, an antibody that will detect a certain thing that's in the environment. But it's the same thing. You um, deliberately absorb the antibody that's specific to the agent that you're trying to find to the plate. And then you incubate, and you block the plate, course, and then you incubate with your sample, and your sample may contain some of these target antigens, which is the green green balls in there, and then you wash, and then come in with your uh, signal generator antibody, which, re again, recognizes the other, the other side of the uh, antigen that's been captured, and then you can generate a signal using uh, TMB. There's a bunch of different substrates for HRP. But this is very commonly used for a lot of uh, clinical diagnostics where you're looking for really low concentrations of a particular substance. And, you know, you're down in the nanogram to uh, uh, picogram per mil concentration range. So these are very sensitive formats, but, uh, you know, you have to, when you're building these, you have to know what you're doing at the very beginning so you don't end up with a bunch of false information by the time you get to this stage where you're actually exposing uh, your uh, samples to the plates. This is a negative readout antigen competition. This is also something that is used, will be used in, in a couple of the later, uh, a couple of the later um, uh, immunoassay formats here. Or we'll get to those in a little bit. The negative readout is essentially a, a plate where you put on, in this case, a specific antibody to an agent that you're trying to monitor or detect, and then you come in, and then you, then in addition to this, before you, you know, start using these, you have titrated in a certain concentration of the same analyte or similar analogous analyte that has, in this case, an HRP uh, attached to it. It could be a fluorescence type tag, uh, but any type of signal generator. And so in the absence of any of the target antigen, most of these, um, these signal generator um, antigens or analytes will bind to the, the antibody on the plate. In my past life, I think we do, we did use like a about a like a two, two to three fold excess of the um, signal generator analyte standard uh, to make sure we do get uh, full binding in the absence of the target antigen. But should your sample contain the target antigen, uh, then that's a different ballgame because what will happen is that will come in 
and it will compete with the uh, the HRP analyte standard, and it's, it, in in so doing, you you generate a, a lower uh, signal because there will not be after you wash this plate, there will not be as many of the antibodies bearing a signal generating analyte. So the more of the analyte antigen you have in your sample, the lower the signal that you will see when you run your ELISA. And so it's a negative readout because instead of having um, more signal for more analyte, we have less signal for more analyte. But this is, this is useful in, in certain situations. This is a um, commonly, commonly used um, uh, solid phase format. Again, we're using beads, and the bead is a solid support. The nice thing about these is this is talking about um, where you've got a situation where you have a, a paramagnetic beads that are coated with such with some material so that you can actually couple, say, a specific antigen or a specific antibody to the yellow beads that are in here. And the the beads have tremendous surface area. They are easily uh, pulled down when you turn on an electromagnet. So it's very easy to wash the the bound material. Um, uh, it's very easy to wash the excuse me, the unbound uh, material from the system, you do a couple washes, and then uh, you can come in with your HRP or some other signal generator um, sandwich antibody. So this is basically the sandwich antibody, sandwich ELISA, but in a bead format. It's it's great because you they have you know they have high, high surface area. They have because they're moving around the the binding kinetics is much better to the antigen, so it's not a static situation like you have with a an ELISA plate where these antibodies are just stuck to the bottom of the bottom of the plate. And these are this system is used quite a bit for uh, in the larger uh, diagnostics companies that are want to do uh, quick sampling of say hospital samples or various stuff like that and they need an answer pretty quickly. And when you use a format like this, you don't have to do a, a two hour, one hour, I mean it's a lot of this, these assays could be done in under an hour uh, because you, the, the binding kinetics is so fast, the wash steps are fast, the, the ability to uh, detect uh, is very, very sensitive because you've got, you know, the analyte present here. And on top of that, they can take a system like this, and when they develop, when they when they develop their assays, they have a, they calibrate. Their their uh, their detector their assays so that they don't have to go to equilibrium to get an a, a sample answer. They can um, look at the change in slope on a curve, and they know that a certain slope will correspond to a certain concentration of the analyte that's in your in your sample. So the reading is quickly. It's automated. And it's very useful, and so it's, it's a long way from the, the prototype ELISA format. But in, if you have the instrumentation and electronics, which they do, this is a great format to uh, utilize. Here's another example of a solid phase type immunoassay. This is the Ellie Spot. This was developed initially to uh, observe uh, specific cytokines that are coming out of cell populations and what you what you would do is you would uh, you would put uh, down uh, an antibody coating and then you would come down with a coating where basically you grow your cells so this is all aseptic type protocol and then the cells would generate in their regions they would generate a cytokine if they're making them at all and then the antibodies in the vicinity would, would be able to quickly detect uh, and grab those uh, cytokines that are being generated from your uh, clonal cell population, you wash, and then you come in like a sandwich, and you can determine the, 
uh, different uh, different foci, the different cell populations that are uh, secreting this particular cytokine, uh, which is the the uh, the uh, sample on the left with all the red spots. So it's it's very useful, very sensitive, and it actually can identify specific cell populations that are of interest to you. Now here's a lateral flow that system that again it's a solid phase. In this case, you have the the um, the uh, uh, antigen is is made so that the the in the presence of of, uh, of analyte, the the HRP antigen will go further up the the wick as the sample is taken up the wick, and in the absence of antigen. Uh, all of the HRP antigen will bind to the gray rectangle there, hypothetically. If, you know, you do get some leakage. I, I was one of the first people that worked on these way, way back in, in another lifetime. But yeah, the presence of antigen will cause, uh, depending on the concentration, um, one band, two band, three bands. So you can titrate that out a little bit so you get a rough idea of what, how much of the uh, antigen is present in your liquid sample. It could be a milk sample. It could be, you know, just about anything. And they're quick, and it doesn't, you know, take a lot of technology to analyze. And it tells quite on the on you know, on site whether or not you have a an issue or not, or you still have an issue. This type of format is used for point of care testing. Uh, these it's essentially what's used like in a home pregnancy test. It's the same concept. You have the you have the uh, conjugate, conjugate, and then they should all be uh, bound to that initial area, unless of course you've got analyte present, in which case it will move out. Uh, the round circle is the engine you're looking for. The diamond shape. Uh, uh, Structure is the internal uh, control, antigen control, and so in the in the absence of any antigen, you will see um, only binding of these of these um, uh, structures. Uh, and usually they're using like colloidal gold and various things like that that uh, you can just see it when they concentrate. You will only see it bound to the control line. Uh, in the presence of the analyte, the antigen that you're looking for, uh, then it will uh, bind to the, the test line. So it's basically a yes/no. You have no idea how much is in there. You just know that there's enough there to generate a positive. So in all all these formats, um, the common denominator that we seem to have is um, signal variability, well to well if you're using an ELISA system, or it could be assay point to assay point uh, if you're using one of the more solid phase uh, lateral flow type system. But variability is always a problem. You want to be consistent. If you have this, if you have a common amount of analyte in your sample, uh, when you measure that, you should get the same signal. Um, Within every within every test situation, and that should not vary. Excessive background is another problem. Where if a, if the background is real high, you can't really detect the positive uh, signal in there because uh, it's all noise. Sometimes you end up with uh, no fluorescence or color metric or some type of signal. That is usually a a, 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 a problem related to. The fact that you either did run the assay right, or maybe your antibody that's in there is not specific for the analyte that you're looking for. And obviously, that's a big problem. And then dose response. All these, um, the the semi quantitative um, yes no ones. That's not a dose. Dose response is not part of that equation. But with the with the um, the ones that are semi quantitative, the more sample you add to it the more signal you should see 
or if you're using the negative readout, the more analytes you have, the lower type, uh, the lower the amount of signal that you should observe. Again, it's a dose response based on how much analyte is present. For in your ideal plate coating scenario, we would like to see um, basically uh, antibodies all lined up with the business side up, and and uh, and so they can bind to the to the analyte that's coming in. Uh, but in the real world, you usually see something like this, where the antibodies uh, absorb to the ELISA plate or your other type of solid support surface, they usually look like what's up in number one, where they're not all facing in the right direction or whatever. There is a way to, um, to make this look more attractive, and that would be if you coated your plates in advance with protein A and then, cause, because they bind to the FC portion of these antibodies. They would all be pointing mostly up in the right business up direction. Uh, you may have not enough in number two. You may not have enough antibody. You didn't use a high enough coating concentration. Or you may have too much. Uh, and that would be number three, where you, you added too much antibody and they start piling up on each other. And uh, this uh, the piling itself will cause the surface to be very sticky, so you'll get uh, high backgrounds uh, in, in, a, in a general sense. Uh, the backgrounds will go way up if you've got antibody piled up there. And the other thing is when they're, when they're uh, put in there, you've got uh, steric issues where you will end up with uh, antibody that can't get to the antigen, and so you get the what we call the low-sensitive uh, hook effect where you've got so much, uh, so much signal, uh, a signal capacity there, but the plate capacity is very limited in what it can bind. And so instead of getting a higher response as you increase, you end up with a, uh, a lower signal. And number four is if you were to coat it with, with uh, antibody uh, you, and you didn't use a very nice coating buffer, uh, you could denature some of your antibodies that you put on the plate uh, before they ever have a chance to work, and now that, that's what's in number four. So coating buffers, the traditional ones, the carbonate, uh, pH 9.6, uh, 0.02 molar carbonate, that was the first ones they used. They had low ionic strength and high pH. The idea there was that the low ionic strength will allow the, allow the antibodies or antigens to stick to the polystyrene and the ELISA plates better. Back then, the ELISA plates were not very good quality. They didn't understand all the binding, you know, uh, adsorbance chemistries that it takes to make for a higher binding plate. So they had to go to extreme conditions in order to get their, their antigen or antibody to stick to the plates. The problem is these are harsh on antibodies and antigens, and in some cases you could completely denature your antibody during the coating process. Um, our company, we use a, a less alkaline, we're in pH 8 type range, and we use a higher uh, ionic strength. And with the current state of the plate coating chemistry in ELISA's, uh, you don't need to go to those harsh extremes up there. And so a buffer like what our company provides will generally give you good, good binding, uh, high efficiency binding, but also it's also going to be consistent all the way across the plate, and you're not going to denature your, your, your either your antigen or your antibody that you're putting down there because the conditions are so harsh. Now, blocking is always an issue. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but frequently it is. When you block a surface, you first, you know, put down what you want and let that stick to the plate, and then you uh, add your blocker, and the idea is that the blocker is supposed to block all those unoccupied regions where the antibody antigen is not located. And this is 
what you're looking for. But the reality is blockers don't always uh, fit the bill in that sometimes they're the uh, non-specific antibody uh, can bind to the can bind to the plate as a number one. Uh, you can get cross reactivity of your secondary antibody. That's the signal generator with a blocker. That's really a bad situation, and you this should never happen, but unfortunately it does. In the third third situation, uh, you could have the your blocker uh, is such that um, things that that uh, that uh, the iron blocker surface may actually act like glue <laughs> or Velcro to the signal generator antibody. And so you're putting down, you're allowing the signal generator antibody to bind for the, not, for the wrong reason. Uh, and fourth case is when you have material um, uh, in the samples where that material, like it could be a um, IgM type, type molecule, in certain people, they have this, and they're very healthy, but they have very sticky IgM. If that IgM uh, from the sample could stick to the blocker, when the uh, plate's washed and you come in with the signal generator antibody, yeah, they, those antibodies, those IgM antibodies, will stick to the conjugate coming in, and it is a really frustrating mess. And the, when these situations happen, you have to figure out a way to keep the orange interfering substance from sticking to the blocker. And you have to come in with some creative uh, uh, conditions so that the, the antibody that's bound to the plate still remains active, but you keep the other uh, IgM or other type of antibody from not specifically sticking to the, to the blocker. We have different blo additional blocking considerations. There's a whole bunch of things here. Uh, you you want to not only stick uh, block the plate, but you also want to uh, cover some of the sticky portions of what you've absorbed to the plate without either obscuring the antigenic epitopes if you're pulling a plate with antigen, or without interfering with uh, hypervariable regions. Uh, on the FAB portions of the antibodies, so it, it's kind of a fine line there. Where you want to you want to block the plate, but you also want to uh, stabilize the absorbed antibody when you end up drying it. Now, if you're just going to use it wet, that that's, that then you don't really have a big issue here. But if you want to make up a bunch of plates and dry them down for for use six months or a year from now, then you also have stability issues, and the blocker is supposed to not only keep stuff off, but it's also supposed to keep the antibody or antigen stable until you come around to have to use the assay. And our company offers several different um, blocking iterations. The idea of the blocker is we want to stabilize what's absorbed on there, whether it be an antibody, peptide, protein, or whatever, we want to stabilize it. Uh, we want to minimize non-specific binding because we're, we're basically blocking the plate surfaces that are not covered by the stuff that we want on there. And then we also uh, want to make sure that it contains an antimicrobial agent for downstream uh, when you are um, using these plates, you know, six months from now. And even though in a dried state, you would definitely want to have an antimicrobial in there just to be sure that you don't have bacterial degradation uh, after storage. Now, stabilizing is, stabilization is kind of a big deal. If you do not, again, plan on, plan on drying and making a whole bunch of plates so you can, you know, have precision and repeatability, then it's not as big a deal. But if you are going to have assays that can be used, you know, a month or six months or a year or two from now, you need to know how you can stabilize the active components 
that are in the assay. Now you have two 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 uh, two two phases here. We have the solid phase where basically you have the antigen or antibody adsorbed to the plate, or you have a liquid phase, which is usually the antibody, up antibody, or the conjugate and all that stuff. So a couple of the factors here that were these where these uh, where this problem is addressed now with a solid phase things tend to be easier from the point of view that if you're absorbing something onto a plate surface uh, your engine your antibody they will lay down on that plate surface and that will partially stabilize those proteins or other antigens because they are adsorbed to the surface so you got multi point attachment uh, whereas um, if you if you're using um, if you're drying your plates down, uh, the liquid that would normally be present if you dry them down, you do not have the issue with protease degradation that would hydrolyze the various components either on the antibody or the antigen. So by keeping things in a dry state, uh, you avoid most of the hydrolysis protease degradation. Uh, problems that you would still have in the liquid state. Now in the liquid phase, you need to stabilize the secondary and tertiary structure of the antibody, if, if that's what you're in your uh, liquid phase. So you need to stabilize the uh, either the antigen, the antibody proper, uh, the enzyme, if you're using an enzyme, uh, or your antibody enzyme conjugate. Um, the Stabilizers that we use associate with the hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions of the uh, of the, the uh, up phase of the um, of the uh, protein. Um, they stabilize the um, assay component that is in the liquid phase. Okay, I got that right. Catalytic regions. The enzyme itself has a catalytic region, and so we need to not only stabilize the antibody, but we need to also stabilize the enzyme, if it's an enzyme you're using, and the big part of that is to stabilize the catalytic site of the enzyme, which you need you know, operational when you go ahead to start running your assay. We incorporate buffer salts, various uh, ionic strength maintenance uh, additives to make sure that the uh, you know the, the molecules are in a, a good situation. Um, we also um, include antimicrobial agents since these are in a solution, our liquid phase. They are subject to uh, bacterial uh, protease-related degradation. All right, here's a happy slide here. This was one that. Dr. Christy Strandberg created for me. Um, she, I was trying to show how uh, a conjugate stabilizer not only has to stabilize the conjugate, but in, in, in stabilizing conjugate, it also has to stabilize the, the um, catalytic site. This is a porphyrin ring structure uh, on the right here and above there, and that's the, where the redox uh, activity occurs when HRP is oxidizing and reducing and basically calling the, causing the color change or the chemiluminescent signal production. So it's a, it's a twofold thing. You have to stabilize not only the, the uh, secondary and tertiary uh, configuration of the proteins, of which HRP is also a protein, but you have the additional uh, challenge that you have to stabilize the catalytic site uh, because if that breaks down, you may have a very Nice looking HRP and a very nice looking antibody, and it may bind very well to the to the to the upside of the captured antigen. But without the catalytic site, it's essentially not there. So it's an it's a non-player. So it is a big deal to not only stabilize the antibody and and HRP uh, uh, protein structure, but you also have to figure out a way to stabilize the the catalytic sites. Of the enzymes that are in, in whose job is to generate uh, a signal uh, in their presence. 
Okay, we have uh, we provide multiple uh, webinars, videos. Uh, we try to, you know, we try to present ourselves as a company where you could call us up and get a pretty decent answer, pretty legitimate answer on any types of questions that you call about, especially if you're calling about our products. I do help people on other things as well, um, but the, our, our whole uh, claim to fame is that we, if you have a technical question, you can call and a person who knows what they're talking about will, will talk to you directly or they will get right back to you. And um, we, we have developed these products in-house, whether they be the enzyme assays or the, the, uh, the fluorescence products. And we've developed them. We know the problems that are associated with them. And we can give you a straight answer as to what's going on or, or what maybe you need to do to uh, improve your assay performance. For attending this webinar, you can get a 20% off discount on um, any of our uh, products. And just use this code here. and. Um, I'm sure that Jackie will see that and give you your your discount. Um, but I would like to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to me ramble here. Uh, if you can see, I don't do this for a living, but uh, I do know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I we hope that you consider us for your ELISA development needs as well as your intracellular protease detection uh, type fluorescence detector needs as well, because we are here to help you, and that's, uh, that's a big part of what we like to do. Jackie? Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we do have a few questions here today. Um, everyone who's attending here, feel free to chat in your questions. Um, I'll address the ones I can in the last few minutes that we have here. Um, but if we don't get to your question, um, understand that we will follow up with you with a technical response after the webinar. Uh, but to get started here, um, someone's asking, you know, their samples are reading too high, uh, but the standard curve looks fine. What should they do? Okay, if their samples are reading too high, what essentially what's going on there is they are they're getting a non-specific binding event that's essentially related to the fact that there's something in their samples that's causing the um, the um, the the op antibody, the signal generator, HRP conjugate, and usually in this case, to bind it non-specifically. So they are getting uh, a much higher uh, uh, signal than what should be there. Now, on the other side of the coin, they may have a good standard curve, but when they're running their samples, uh, because of the type of sample they have, uh, plasma, serum, whatever, these are complex samples, and so there are uh, these these sample environments are very uh, non-conducive for antigen antibody interaction. So you may have a very nice looking standard curve, but when you have that same amount of analyte present in your sample, because the binding kinetics are bad or lower because of the sample matrix, uh, you will get a lower signal. So you're basically under recovering versus the other situation where you're over recovering. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have here, um, someone's saying that their ELISA results that they're getting are inconsistent between their assays. Uh, why might this be? The biggest problem with, with uh, assay to assay uh, precision variability is that the, the capture portion, or the, whether it be the engine on the surface or whether it be the say the antibody, if you're using that type of system, if that will vary because you didn't coat your, your plate surface very well, some wells contain more antigen capture capacity than others, then you will have a different answer uh, for a common concentration as you go across the plate. And that's a huge problem uh, that people have. Uh, the other issue is that the, the precision may be affected by the fact that something is too close to the edge or, you know, it's getting warmer so the kinetics are binding, you know, kinetics for binding are better, so you get higher signals around the edge and less in the middle. Uh, 
and that can vary from plate to plate too, depending on where the plate is sitting if you're using an incubator. So these are a couple of the, the main problems for uh, assay, assay variability. Great, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, we have another person here saying that they're seeing edge effects in their assays. Can you speak to these edge effects and how someone could go about preventing these? Now, the edge effects I mentioned a little bit in the, with the prior answer. The edge effects are generally caused by if you're using um, a 37 degree type uh, situation where you're incubating at an elevated temperature. This is all great, but the outside of the plate will get warmer quicker than the center part of the plate. Edge effects are caused by kinetics where the, the binding kinetics are better or faster on the outer part of the plate and slower on the inner part of the plate. The way to avoid that is to uh, make sure that your plates are, you know, not stacked. Um, try to, um, you know, use longer incubation times because edge effect is most likely to affect a signal if you're using very short incubation times where, uh, you know, a little bit of change on the outside means a lot. Whereas if you go longer, everything is allowed to to uh, catch up. So edge effects are generally uh, heat or, you know, uh, temperature environment uh, related. Gotcha. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Um, we have someone here wondering, um, you know, just, just on a basic level here, you know, what's the best washing procedure when preparing an ELISA? The wash procedures, um, generally when you're going to do a wash, you need to make sure that when you're aspirating out the, the stuff that you want to throw away the, after the and incubation period is ended, uh, you want to make sure that you're getting all of the prior solution out of those wells. The second thing that's important is, is that when you are filling those wells, you make sure that the wells are all filled evenly from well to well to well, and you don't have a, you know, a problem with your, your, if you have an autofiller or if you have a, a manifold template type thing where one well is not getting as much as the other, uh, then you have problems there as well. So it's consistent uh, washing, consistent aspiration, and probably a bigger thing is that you need to wash at least three times, preferably four, uh, and then allow that plate to sit there a little bit before you, um, you know, aspirate off the wash buffer. This allows you to, number one, you're getting an extra wash, which is good, but also letting it sit there just a little bit will allow more time for the material that's not specifically bound to the plate to come off the plate surface before, you know, something else comes in there again. So it's kind of a, a hybrid of efficient washing and making sure that uh, you uh, wash enough times, and usually I think the number four is, you know, usually number three, three times in the middle, but that fourth one where you've got conjugate in there, uh, you, you definitely want to make sure the, that conjugate gets at least four washes, and, and also don't let it dry too much before you uh, add your substrate. That can be a problem. Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap it up here with just one last question today. Uh, we've got another standard curve question here. Um, so someone has a standard curve, but it's a very low curve with poor discrimination between the points. Uh, you know, what can that person do for their assay? The, the standard curve is very low. It tells me that their um, antibody coding capture type of parameter is not very efficient, and they, they need to either um, increase the amount of uh, antibody coating that's on there, on, coated on the plate surface, or they need to uh, incubate their uh, plates longer with the samples to allow uh, a greater amount of time for the anilide to be captured onto the plate surface. They can also increase the concentration of their conjugate, that's on the back end, and uh, use a higher conjugate concentration, and that'll give you uh, a higher signal. And they can 
also use a more sensitive uh, substrate. A sub there are different levels of uh, TMB substrates uh, from you know, low sensitivity to high sensitivity, and so if you use a more sensitive substrate on the back end, you'll get a lot more uh, bang for your buck when it comes to the single generation because they're uh, they're much more sense they pr they generate a more sensitive um, uh, product that can be uh, measured OD wise by your uh, play reader. Great, thanks. Uh, well, that's about all the time that we have for today here. Uh, if we were unable to get to your question, you know, I, I acknowledge, I see a couple people we weren't able to get to their questions yet. Um, you know, some had some some lengthier questions, um, but you know, we will be following up with you personally, you know, right after the webinar here. Uh, and again, I will be sending out the webinar recording within the next day or so. Our next webinar will be scheduled soon. Uh, you can look for this webinar on our webinars page, you know, check back in a few days and, and see what's scheduled there. Uh, if you do think of any questions after the webinar or have ideas for future webinars, feel free to fill out the Contact Us form on our website or reach out to us through social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter. And thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us, and have a wonderful day.